Oh, okay. We're recording. Are we ready? Okay. Three, two, one, go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 108. We're it's a lot of live feedback of more Apple talk. We there's a lot of news that came out since we recorded last, and I almost wanted to tell Tom, hey Tom, we really need to have a follow-up show. But I said, you know what? There's gonna be more news. We're gonna have a weekend, we're gonna have time to sit on it. Let's wait until obviously today, Wednesday, and figure out what else we can talk about because there's definitely a lot of news that came out. So Tom, what else did we hear? Well, you know, the just the Department of Justice uh, has never lied in the history of the American people ever. Not even once. It's a fact. Look it up. Um, the Internet but said it, it turned. Yeah. Yeah. The Internet said it was true. But it turns out that they made a mistake. They were totally mistaken and accidentally said it was just one iPhone that they wanted Apple to unlock. Um and they, they mixed it up. They probably just like forgot a digit or when they're printing it, the printer like messed up and print this. But it's actually 12 iPhones. Um, and it's really easy to see how that could be just a totally honest mistake. You know, it's not like they would say, well, it's just this one thing to a court and then present papers to Apple saying a completely different thing. I mean, that would just be wrong. That's immoral. I mean, well. So Tom, what Tom's trying to get at is, yeah, there was uh, there was a there was a report this morning or yesterday that said uh, the Department of Justice wants to, wants Apple just to unlock this one phone, but they also have twelve other phones in the queue that they're also trying to fight with Apple on getting unlocked, and they're and they're fighting with them. This one is the most prevalent because obviously uh, the terrorists are associated with it, but. I mean, who knows? There's more. Yeah, and it's it's for various cases. It's not for terrorist attacks or saving the children or whatever they would have you believe. But it does give you warm fuzzies when you look at this paper and it says, you know, hey, we requested Apple to unlock this iPhone here. Apple declined. We requested Apple to uh, unlock this iPhone on this date and Apple declined. And it just goes down that list. Apple just keeps declining. And it's a good thing. Apple is fighting back. Um, I mean, they, you know, the, the government's not paying them to do this development or paying them to unlock these phones. They're just saying, hey, could you unlock these for us? And uh, I think Apple's just had enough of it. I mean, if you're looking at it, Southern District of New York, Southern District of New York, Eastern Dis- District of New York, Northern District of Illinois, Northern District of California, Northern District of Illinois, Southern District of California, Northern District of Illinois, District of Mass, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, and basically, you're looking at the device type 4S, 4S, 6 Plus, 6, 5S, 6, 5S. We don't know. Southern District of California. We don't know what the device is. We don't know what the device ID is, but they still want it unlocked. iPad 2, Wi Fi, and iPhone 6 Plus. So it looks like. Yeah, and they're all. A lot of them are on uh, in December, December of last year. Twelve nine for a lot of them. So something's going on, and you look at a lot of these are older phones. Yeah, a lot of these have got really old versions of iOS, which means you know we <clears throat> it's it's common knowledge that older versions of iOS were susceptible to this kind of electronic brute forcing to get into the phone to brute force the passcode and and get you into the device um so this this is actually very telling um it's not that the justice department can't unlock these phones running older versions of ios or older phones themselves because they absolutely can they absolutely have no uh what the justice department is going after here is they're looking for precedent right what everyone was was saying on twitter before last week saying hey look this is a weird request, and we think they're going after judicial precedent here. That is absolutely the case. Can the FBI work around these older versions of iOS? Entirely. Absolutely. No doubt about it, because they have before. 
No, what they want is they want these used as kind of more cannon fodder to throw into the case, saying, well, we asked Apple to do all of these, too, and they're holding up 12 more investigations. It's what see what I don't know what these cases are about, these other 12, but I don't what I don't understand is I have a feeling that they can get a hold of not even one of these phones, but a phone with that old version jailbreak it. I mean, what's jailbreak site? I, I haven't jailbroken an iPhone in forever, but yeah. find the jailbroke break and then try and DMU DMU it from there. Take it, extract the software. Look, the jailbreakers did it. I mean, they have to be able to do that. And if you want to try it on a try it on a junkie phone, I'm sure you, we can go and we can uh, go on eBay, find a 4s with 7.0.4 version, jailbreak it, see if it works, and go from there. I mean, I'm sure we. Yeah, can it's. <laughs> you know, if, if it were up to to us or, or a, a company that unlocks these phones, because there are plenty of companies that sell devices to law enforcement to brute force phone pin codes, um, and they work very well. Um, it, it's not a matter of can. It's it's the principle of the thing. And that's what it looks like the FBI is going after. They they don't really care about the data. Um, you know, even even in in the original phone, right? In the original thing where they say terrorism, and they they try to freak everyone out and say, "But you know, people will die unless we unlock this phone." Um, that's not really the case. So the the terrorists actually they had a work phone and a personal phone, and they destroyed their personal phone before they carried out the attacks. This phone is their work phone. Right. They have their their company's MDM solution, their, the company's monitoring solution on the device. Um, I, I, I know MDM solutions in the past that I have used have allowed us to remotely unlock iPhones or remotely change the pin, which is great when an executive forgets their pin and can't get into their phone after they've set it up and they land in another country and they're freaking out. It's a fantastic feature to say. Here, it's unlocked, and your random pin code is this. Please change it. Um, you know, it, it, there's no telling what's actually on the device right now. Uh, but it's it's fairly safe to say that because the personal phone was destroyed already by the attacker, and the work phone wasn't, You when you're doing OPSEC, when you're thinking about things to cover your tracks, and you go, I should destroy my phone completely. And you don't think, oh, I've got another one of these. I've got my work phone. Let me destroy that one completely too. You know, for me personally, the data that I have on my personal phone, that's kind of important to me, right? It's it's personal. It's got my stuff in it. I don't want anyone getting that data. Would I destroy that phone if I knew it was going to fall into the wrong hands? Absolutely. My work phone, you know what that's got in it? My emails from work that the FBI could get anyway if they asked my employer nicely. Uh, I don't really care about my work phone. I don't keep anything on it. I don't use it for anything. Occasionally, I will read Hacker News or, or play a game, and that's the extent of my phone usage. Uh, but it's, it's pretty clear that there's nothing on here of value anyway. If you dual wield, if you talk to people who dual wield, and I, I guess I'm happy that I don't, everyone tells you that they chose to dual wield phones for exactly the purpose you mentioned. Everything I do on my personal phone is personal and everything I do on work is work related. And yes, I got to carry two phones, but I don't want work ever have having remote access to my phone, which my sister found out when wrote, uh, when work disabled the smart unlock feature on her uh, Android phone. So now when she's in the car, Bluetooth can't unlock it or Wi-Fi can't unlock it or location can't unlock it. She has to type that pin code in every single time. And yep. they could just erase it. You, that's one of the things is that exchange puts in. One of the permissions is that the exchange administrator can just erase your phone whenever they want. Which is great. You know, from a sysadmin point of view, it's, it's not just like the evil IT going, oh, ha, ha, I'm just going to erase Bob's phone because I don't like him today. No, it's great because we've had people get their, you know, at my previous company, we had someone get their phone stolen in an airport. You know, they, they went to grab a cup of coffee or a napkin from somewhere. Uh, they walked away for just a minute and their phone was gone. Right. 
they're holding their bag. They had their computer, but their phone was on the table and it's vanished because busy airports and you never leave things that you don't want stolen in a busy airport. But um, they were able to, you know, find, uh, you know, someone from airport service and use their phone and call us and say, hey, my phone was stolen. What do I do? And we said, okay, hold on. So we logged into our portal. We wiped the phone. The company data is gone, right? They've got the hardware, but we don't care about that. We care about the, the proprietary business data on it. There's nothing of use on this attacker's phone. On this terrorist phone, it's it's the work phone, right? They've probably got hooks into it already. It's, it's precedent. It, it all comes down to precedence. There's no question now. Uh, what the what the FBI wants in this case. They don't care about the phone. They don't care about the data. They don't care about these other pending cases. They only care about being able to force Apple to do the government's dirty work. I didn't even think of it the way you just described it, where uh, the personal phone was destroyed and now they have the work phone. But it makes sense that exactly, if they're dual wielding phones, they know exact, and they destroyed their personal phone, which another thing is, yeah. you, I have a and feeling they, they, they were going to die. They the work phone. They, well, they didn't destroy the work phone. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're going to care about giving work back their phone at the end of the uh, no, day. No, not at all. <laughs> but you know, if if you if you're thinking about if you make the mental connections, if you fire the synapses necessary to say, I should destroy my personal phone and all of the data on it, and you don't fire. The, the, the two synapses of I should destroy my personal phone and I should destroy my work phone are right next to each other. And if that one, if the work one doesn't fire and you don't make that connection of maybe I should destroy my work phone, the answer is clear. There's nothing on the phone. There is nothing of value there that this person cares about losing. It's well, again, it's it's scary to think that that. I keep on going back and forth. So I ask my students this. They say, what should Apple do? And I get, absolutely not. They shouldn't decrypt. And then I start throwing some of these arguments that the Department of Justice is using. Well, they're, it's not the person's phone. It's their work phone. And then I start getting people, well, if it's the work phone, maybe they should. And then somebody comes back with another headline. Well, the, 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 the FBI can't keep it secret. Oh, yeah, there's another point. The FBI can't keep it secret, which we know that the FBI can't keep these things under wrap. If they could, 40 million OPM data with the fingerprints and blood samples and everything wouldn't be let go. So I don't know where this exchange is going to happen. I mean, I trust Apple to keep things way more secret than than the FBI, but the software is going to be on this phone. I mean, we can get into Somebody can take it, right? I mean, they're not going to steal it. But. Yeah, I I mean, it, it's really – creating a tool like this is is so dangerous to Apple, right? Uh, because it's, it's software. It's not like, you know, forging a machine or a weapon that is used – once and you can you know throw it into the fires of Mount Doom to get rid of it. You know, once software is created, it is very, very, very difficult, almost impossible to uncreate that software, uh, especially in a company setting, especially in a setting where you've got um, you know literally every single process around your software design is specifically designed to make sure you never lose data. Right. They're creating this thing. Their their you know workstations are getting backed up to the company server. They've got their version control software siphoning off their changes and making sure everything is perfectly captured in a log with good messages and, and good comments on the commits. Uh, you've got you know other systems uh, for for testing, and now you've got this build on several different phones to test out the configuration on it and make sure it passes QA. And now that department has it. You know, when you're creating software in a company setting, it is almost impossible if you've set up the company correctly and if you're not uh, you know, running it very poorly, it's almost impossible to truly lose created software. So when the FBI says just this one time, it is not. And this tool will exist. It will be around. They, they are creating something truly dangerous that they will forever hold. And I, they don't want to be in charge of that. Well, it's it's a pure and simple. It's a liability. 
My other my other thought was Apple says, you know what? Fine. They rethink because because okay, we're we're a little we're a little less than a year from the next version of iOS. So fine, we're gonna create this. I don't know how long it's gonna take them to create it, but immediately work on iOS 10, make a couple versions of iOS uh iOS 10 that will completely break this functionality. Uh, be a complete redesign of the whole thing so that if it does leak or get out, there's nothing else other than the phones that have never updated. Issue like an out of cycle patch that says anybody on any of these phones, here is the point one version. Ba- almost basically what uh, what TrueCrypt did. Put a version A out that completely breaks all functionality as sort of a canary there. Or... Or you know what? Or the other thing I thought of, these are on old phones, the 5Cs. We're going to recall all the phones that are on the 5C version, and we're going to give you a, fi- uh, a 5S with the fingerprint. Just completely recall them and go from there. Well, I mean, I mean, think about it this way. So if Apple did that, if they said, okay, well, if it's true what you're saying, it's just this one phone, then we'll go ahead and create the software. They create the software. And then they push the emergency patch to all the phones to break that specific functionality. All Apple has to do is release a dot to release and take that you know back out or subvert it in some way or introduce different vulnerabilities for the FBI because they were requested to. Um, the, what this does, and this has been pointed out online several times on Twitter, on blogs, uh, and it's absolutely accurate. What this does if the FBI wins this case is it completely destroys the integrity of the software update. You know, what do you do personally when an update comes out? When when your phone says, hey, you should you should update these apps, or or your phone says, hey, there's a new version of iOS or Android, click here. Or Windows is pestering you about updates, or your Mac goes, uh, we've got some updates over here if you'd like to click to install those. You know, you click it, you know it's going to make you more secure. Uh, it's going to give you more features, more stable software. It's a great thing to do. You have to update, and you know it's a good thing. But if the FBI wins this case, if Apple subverts that entire process, what happens is people stop trusting the Apple the Apple updates. They say, well, is this Apple or is this the FBI trying to get my stuff, right? Is, is this update going to make me less secure in some way? Uh, you know, should I update this? Do I really care about the security patches? Are they really security patches? Or is it just another foothold for the FBI to get in the door? And the software update process from developer to end user is sacred and trusted and should not be be mucked with or muddied in any way. It is very important. If end users stop trusting updates, the world as we know it gets less secure by the day. Unfortunately, if you look at Apple and iTunes and the Mac App Store, and I'll let smarter people with Apple who complain about this explain it. Basically, people are afraid of the Apple updates because it does exactly break functionality. <laughs> That's one. It, it does. Apple Apple does not have a good track record right now. But but there's a big difference between, wow, the new iPhoto is horrible, and this update makes the FBI get into my system. Right? Cool. There's, there's, there, those are two wildly separate you know, parts of the system. Now, on Linux, the updates are great because you go, oh, cool, new free stuff, and it's more secure. On Windows, you go, uh, I got to restart. Well, I guess, yeah, I got to restart, but at least I'm not getting hacked this week. Um, it, it's, yeah, but, it's funny because <laughs> they're under the guise of bug fixes. <laughs> we just got some yeah. bug fixes. We can't tell you what those bugs are, which I kind of would like to know what bug. We found a phenomenal bug that does this that we'll fix. But then you have the model like Chrome or even now Windows 10 it look, almost looks like where they just update without you knowing. Like you just get oh, yeah. a new it just, update. It just goes. And, and to be honest, a lot of people, I mean, including myself, I really do like that because I don't have to think it's automatic. Yeah. Now, but again, I trust Google that they're putting the best software on. I'm trusting Apple as much as they don't trust the software that they're they're doing this. Microsoft, for the most part, I still trust. But I mean, we heard right. Both- so, so what happens if you know you you don't have reproducible builds? You're not taking the source code for. 
Chrome uh, or Chromium or Signal and building that alongside the binary build you get from the Play Store, you get from, from Google's download servers. You're not comparing those because no one does, right? There's probably like three people in the world doing deterministic builds and comparing hashes. Um, they're great people and their work is very undervalued, but no one does it. Um, you know, what, what happens if, uh, if the FBI wins this case and you get a signal update from the Play Store, right? And they're not allowed to release the source code of the update, but they pushed an update, right? Is it the FBI coercing signal with this new judicial precedent to say, hey, we need backdoors into your communications, or we need to save the children, catch the terrorist, patriotic America, oorah? We don't know. It breaks that process. It becomes a judicial precedent to break that process. It's... Um... Yeah, I mean, we're Updates still going to hear sacred. We're going to hear a lot more. I mean, we talked about what we've heard, okay. and then, and then, because if it's not Apple, like we did hear that Bill Gates has said, you know what, the Apple should do it. But we all know that Microsoft has been in the in bed with the government forever, and this is nothing new. I mean, they're probably getting paid, and we're just unaware of it. I, I did hear that Gates kind of backtracked on what he said, or he wasn't happy about the way he was portrayed. But you know what? What you said is entirely accurate. Microsoft is the government. Microsoft has been in the government's back pocket since Microsoft existed. Um, you know, when it when it comes to you know, backdoors and security vulnerabilities, Microsoft tells the NSA, they tell the security agencies before they fix anything, right? They go, hey, there's a big issue here. You should probably go use it before you patch it next week. Um, and I, I realize there's, they could do that to, you know, make sure that the security agencies get patched first, but of, of course they're going to use that. Um Look, we yeah. figure this out, and then you hear that Windows 10 automatically updates. There's none. There's yeah. none of it's all. Cortana is always listening. Um, you can't. You can't see what the updates are. There's different vectors for updates, and you start. And, and you want to believe that they're really truly trying to be safe, but then you know. Then you hear that Bill Gates says, "Yeah, absolutely, you should do this," and and then. And then, you, and you then, saying, then you hear about all this horrible stuff with Windows 10 and Microsoft saying, hey, here's an update. Here's an update. And oh, man, the way they push Windows 10. It's terrifying. I, you know, I went to do just standard Windows updates the other day. And I just said, yeah, go ahead. Just just do your updates. And it said, OK, it'll be, uh, you know, four gigs pulled down. It's like, hold on a minute. Big Windows updates are less than a gig. So I went into the updates, and sure enough, Windows 10 is recommended. I said, no, I, I don't want that right now. Go away. I will update when I'm ready. Why did you check that by default? So people are already learning to distrust updates from Microsoft, right? They, they today put out um, you know advertisements on Windows 10 lock screens. What is going on? Well... And then, well, I'll go, let's take it back a little bit, back to more security type things with the FBI. Today, uh, a couple of days ago, February 10th, so a few days ago, we hear that James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, says, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking into the Internet of Things as another spying vector to check, to check up on people. And we're all now, everyone's starting to buy all these connected everything because sometimes you have a choice, sometimes you don't. I mean, I bought a house with three Nest thermostats. They're not looking to raise the temperature of my house, but they're looking to do stuff with it. I mean, they'll, they'll the gather network. your proximity data. They'll leverage a glibc vulnerability to to get into your network. They'll, they'll uh, do all these I mean, things. Yeah, and, there's there's a lot of potential there. And so, and it's it's really crazy to think that that yes, they're trying to do whatever they can again. This is to keep us safe. This is all for safety. The problem uh -huh. is when do we say, when do we start saying, hey, wait a second, I don't mind being slightly unsafe if I'm allowed to not have to worry about everyone always listening or somebody showing up to my door or uh, uh, tailored advertising. I don't necessarily want to know. I don't want everyone to know when I'm home and when I'm not home. And I don't want, I mean, the government to get hacked. 
I mean, that's the last thing you want. If I, there's a huge target on spec, let's get this data because if we get this data, then we have a lot of leverage. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the NSA is collecting an unprecedented amount of data. And have we stopped to think? And I know this has been brought up before, but it's it's still a good thing to think about. What happens if you know everyone loves to scream China? But what happens if anyone? You know, from from some you know random kid on 4chan to uh, you know state actors in China uh, working to actively subvert capitalism or you know just destroy industry or compete really well in industry. Um, you know what what happens if someone breaks into the NSA and gets all the data they're collecting, or the FBI, or any one of the spying agencies in America? Right, that's a huge huge problem, and we might not hear about it because it might be one of those things of, uh, you know, there's political discourse and you say, Hey, look, don't do anything with that data. Don't make it public. Uh, but it, you know, definitely gives them more weight at the negotiating table. And then now we hear, so we have, you have the FBI trying to break into the internet of things. And then you hear that uh, from a couple months ago that Tor, that CMU was being paid a lot of money, Carnegie Mellon, about how to break Tor. I I, want to say that they helped create Tor, and then they were being paid to systematically break it. And, of course, they couldn't say anything because they were under an NDA. But now we find out that, yes, that the feds did hire CMU to break it. So now is Tor safe? I mean, still, yes, but it's now it's another question you have to ask. Right. And, yeah, with with the ever present modifier on save, which is Tor is safer than using clear text connections uh, if you've got good OPSEC. Right. If you get on the Tor browser, you log into Facebook and then in that same Tor browser, you buy drugs. You're probably not the best thing to do because now you've just identified yourself on that connection. Um but, you know, that's the ever-present modifier. Uh, there are some quick, very quick uh, little uh, news blurbs to go through. Um, turns out that uh, hacking cars is cool and fun and more people should do it. Um, API vulnerability uh, in the Nissan Leaf, uh, the uh, Nissan's electric car. Um, they've got this online system that lets you, you know, turn on your seat warmers or your AC or your car heat. So you can do that online or from your phone. And then when you go out to your car, you know, your car is nice and toasty. Um, Nothing like you could disable the brakes or make it take off into a crowd of people or anything, but you know, you could be driving along and your car will beep and the AC will turn on full blast. And that's annoying. So that's, now public and still an issue. Uh, luckily, there is a workaround available. So if you have a Nissan Leaf, go to Google, um, type in Nissan Leaf API vulnerability. That's my alarm clock going off, and uh, you will you will get the nice workaround for that. But again, I mean, obviously they build software, and then we have to try and fix it. But how long was this known? Remember, we were, you're dealing with people who are actively trying to make money off of this, so they right. find it out now. I mean, when they talked about the hacking the the Chrysler cars, the Jeeps, it was how long did other people know about that? Now, they were good. Uh, Charlie Miller and crew were good about disclosing everything. Hey, we're trying to do this. We're trying to do this. But again, we have the hacking team with hundreds of zero days selling on the open market, making money, collecting data. What else is going on? And that's, that's, I mean, again, the scary part and where you have to say, do I really need this smart whatever? Do I really yeah. need a Bluetooth-enabled uh, key fob, which we didn't really talk about? But you can hack a, uh, we can hack you can hack the key fobs from far away and get access to the door and just go off. Uh huh. So yeah, I actually you know to do replay attacks on the the clicky remotes that everyone has on every car now, um, or especially the keyless entry stuff is trivial. Uh, if you guys want to know more about that. Uh, you can send us an email, grab us on Twitter or uh, or Signal, and we'll be happy to talk to you about that uh, or even do a full show if you would like. So, and again, we're, we're counting down, but we do have a security questions group on Signal. People are asking questions. We, we can always, I don't know if there's a limit on Signal groups, but as long as you're- We haven't found it yet. 
as long as you're not a jerk, you are welcome to join us and ask yep. your questions and not spam us, but ask your questions and we can get you your answers. And if you we're not that hard to find, so you can figure it out or just private message us and we'll obviously let you in after a, what is it, a, a, a Synac handshake? Is that the, that's not the right word. Yeah. That's a confirmation. Synac -ac. A, a synac yeah. So anyway, and we'll, we'll exchange public keys and, and we'll get on it. So anyway, we're done with five seconds left. We'll see everyone next week. Have a good night. See everyone.